Amen. Yes, I'd like to grab those cards from you on your way out today. And then I'd like for you to, to bring those thoughts and those items with you in your mind on Tuesday night. We're going to do something very different for groups this month, just for the month of August. If you have a group already that you're meeting with, you follow the lead of that group leader. Go to that group. If you don't have a group or want to just come to both, you can come Tuesday night at 7 o'clock here for something a little different. We're going to do things a bit differently in the month of August for groups, but we're going to work on those things that you just wrote down on those cards because I think they're pretty important. They're very important to you. Welcome to the book of Joel, our sermon series about the end of the world. And Pastor Hank was just remarking on how it was great that we had Wildlife One up here talking about creation at the beginning of the world. And then we're going to begin a sermon series now about the end of the world. So you can't say that the camp doesn't cover it all, everyone. <laughs> Everything in between. We're going to begin now, if you can find the book of Joel, chapter 1. And let's do this, what my kids and I did this week. Oh boy. Can we find the book of Joel, first of all? Because he's one of those people that you would call a minor prophet, which I wouldn't say that to his face when you see him one day. His, what the message that he has is very important, it's just it's very short. And we find it somewhere near the middle of our Bible. So let's see, if we did this, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, then help me out, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and then Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. What's next? Amos. So if you get to Amos, you've gone too far. But right in there, you'll find the book of Joel. And if you would, turn to Joel chapter 1. And everybody say, the end. The end. That is Joel's message. And we're going to spend some time on that this month, the month of August. Verse 1, the word of the Yah that came to Yoel, Jehovah is God, Yoel, the son of Hethuel. Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days? Or even in the days of your fathers? This is a rhetorical question. We all said, no, no, it hasn't. This is unprecedented. Verse 3, tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. In other words, this is something that's remarkable, something that needs to be passed on. Preserve this in history because something is happening in our, in our country that, that no one's ever seen or hasn't seen in an age that needs to be remembered. Verse 4, what the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. There is a locust plague. And what verse 4 means is that the locusts are coming in waves. Just one right after another. One wave comes in. And you think, oh, well, maybe it won't be so bad. But then another wave comes in, finishes up eating most of what the first wave left. But then finally another wave of locusts come, and now everything is gone. A locust plague like we've never seen before. And Joel is calling out everyone's attention to this. You need to pay attention because this is not just a locust plague. This is the day of the Lord. And Joel is going to call out everyone, starting with the elders there in verse 2. You folks, you've been around for a while. Have you ever seen anything like this? And they're all saying, no, we haven't. And then he calls all the inhabitants of the land in the middle of verse 2. Listen, he wants everybody to pay attention. Look at the foreshadow. This is a locust plague, a really bad one, but it's not just a locust plague. This is the day of the Lord, and no one's paying attention to it. Joel's message in chapter 1 is pay attention to the day of the Lord. Would you guys say that with me? Pay attention to the day of the Lord. These locusts are coming. How many of you have lived through a locust plague? Yeah, me neither. So this is going to be difficult for us. So between the booth and I, we're going to work on some things to help us kind of realize what that might have been like. 
But you know there are still locust plagues today, right everyone? And uh, in Asia, in Middle East, even parts of Africa, East Africa a couple of years ago, swarms of locusts. And locusts seem to always be combined with the conditions of drought, which is the perfect storm for why in the Bible a locust plague is considered just, it's almost stock imagery for God's hand against us. It's hard for us to imagine because we don't have those, but we have had a locust plague in the United States before, I guess. I'll let some of you guys do the work on that. But we're going to watch a video here just to kind of give us an idea of what it might have been like in Joel's day. A locust plague not like any other locust plague that they'd had before. There were so many videos that I wanted to show, but this is the one I thought. I sent it to Matt, and I said, Matt, what do you think about this video? He says, it's horrifying. I love it. <laughs> and so there's your, there's your locust. Maybe we'll watch some more in the weeks to come. Okay, so if nothing else, we'll learn a little bit about locust plague and locusts. And if you look around the, the building today, you're going to see some locusts. But they're going to be, as you have verse 4 there, they're going to be the main image that the prophet Joel is going to use to preach his message. And for all the A students, here you already have your notebooks. Can I see your notebooks, you, all you A students? Look at them. Oh, man. If you don't know something about Joel, you need to go to one of these A students. Find somebody that's got a notebook. The rest of you, you better hurry up and get your notebook, or you've got room there in your Bibles to take some notes, because I'm going to give you some places. We're going to stop. We're going to take some notes, because everybody, the Bible is meant for us to study and learn. So we're going to study and learn, and this month... We're using this great little blue notebook to keep our notes in. Okay, so, so far, by the time you get to verse 4, moms and dads and kids with notebooks, you should have drawn an, your own version of a locust by verse 4, right? Is it really good? Is it amazing artwork? Share it, if you will. But I want to tell you about a strange thing that happened this morning, early this morning. I get to church, I get to church, usually what happens is I get to church early in the morning and then uh, make sure everything's settled, spend some time in prayer while the room is empty, just pray for you all. I can kind of picture where you're going to be sitting and just pray for you and then go th think through the sermon and what needs to happen. And then I usually go home and get breakfast. So by the time I get back, then people start coming. But this morning during that first time when I got here, Joel came for a visit. It's odd, right? But I know that's who it was at first. I was in my office and it's always strange to get a visitor at that time, and so here, here comes this person, comes walking really fast, like a one-man army, right? Walks into my office, and he's wearing kind of, I notice his clothes, he's kind of raggedy, he's got this long beard, his hair's kind of messed up, and then he begins to talk at me instead of to me, and that's when I realized, oh, this is a prophet, this is a preacher, and then all of a sudden, he says to me, Trey, I've got a message just for you and for your congregation. This is for you too. I'm just passing it on. He says, Trey, this is going to be the last sermon series you ever preach. And this is going to be the last sermon series you ever hear. Because at the end of August, at the end of this sermon series, is the end. So I'm kind of processing this, only hearing part of this. So I ask him if he wants to sit down, and I offer him a cup of coffee, and he smacks it out of my hand, the stains on my carpet in my office. And he said, aren't you listening to me? There's no time for sitting. There's no time for coffee. I'm telling you, it is the end. You best figure out what you need to do. And then he storms out. And I plopped down in that new cool leather chair that I got in there from thrift store for 30 bucks. And I'm beginning to scratch my head thinking, what if this crazy man is right? And the end of this sermon series is the end. What would I need to do? 
Two questions pop into my head. The only two that I think matter. Would I be right? Would I be ready? Would I be right with God? Would I be ready for God? I had to sit there and think for a while. So he totally ruined my Sunday morning. So I thought it would only be appropriate that I ruin yours. Would I be right? Would I be ready? If this was the end. Joel chapter 1. We're going to spend our time today in verses 1 to 20, the whole chapter. But right now for reading, we're going to read a passage in it. That kind of symbolizes the, the kind of core of it. It's Joel 1, verses 13 to 15. I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to stand in the honor of the reading of God's word. The Holy Spirit set a fire inside of Joel. He had a burden that he had to preach this message. And then it was recorded. And then the people of God recognized this message came from the Lord. So it was included by and by in your Bibles over the years. And so we give honor to God's word this way. And Jonathan's going to read for us out loud, Joel chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. So just follow along in your Bibles as he reads this out loud. Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into your house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. The entire camp said, Amen. Jonathan, do you mind just praying for this study now? Dear Lord, thank you for uh, another glorious day and time to spend with our church family, uh, worshiping and, and uh, reveling in your word. Uh, please be with Trey as he um, deciphers your word and, and provides it to us so that we can grow stronger and, and, and learn the right path to get back to you, my Lord. In your heavenly name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. Everyone, please be seated. Please make yourself at home and, and let's spend some time in Joel chapter 1 to see what the Lord is saying to us from there. Joel obviously feels like everyone's letting this locust plague go by. This unprecedented, devastating, large-scale disaster is happening, and people aren't paying attention to it. And you know the people who are most not paying attention to it? The people who are least aware that a plague is going on, that it's more than a plague? That's the drunks. They're least aware of anything, right? That's why you get drunk. So that you don't have to pay attention, you don't have to worry, you don't have to listen and see it for what it is. But Joel's going to call out people, group, three groups of people, and he's going to yell at them. And the first one are the drunks. So we're going to spend our time there as we begin. Joel will call out for the drunks, and he's like, you guys need to pay attention. All of you, the elders, verse 2, all elders... The inhabitants of the land, everybody needs to wake up and pay attention that this isn't just a locust plague. This is the day of the Lord. Everybody say, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Yahweh's day. And that's not just, well, it's the Lord's day. That, that means a lot. That's, a, that's a, a little phrase that's packed with meaning in the scriptures, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I've summarized what the scripture teaches about the day of the Lord and specifically Joel, on the back of today's newsletter. So everybody got a little green newsletter when you came in today? If you have just a second, take that out. I just want you to see it on the back for you to read. and Maybe turn that into family devotions or further study this week. Is a, is a short summary article about the day of the Lord. And I'm most interested in how Joel deals with it. But I also show, talk just a bit about Peter and how he deals with it. So that you'll know exactly what that phrase means. Because when Joel's hearers heard this, in verse 15, that this is the day of the Lord. They knew what that meant. Not just a certain day, not just, oh, that's on Tuesday. They knew that this meant something really big. So take some time, if you would, later on to read that article on the back. And then you can pop it into your little blue notebook and collect everything there. But Joel begins by calling out the drunks. 
because they're the ones who obviously are totally unaware of what's going on. And you can imagine Joel um, probably preaching in Judah, probably preaching in Jerusalem itself. So can you picture what Jerusalem looks like in your mind? And then picture Joel kind of walking through Jerusalem, preaching this message, and probably over and over again. And as he's walking, he sees Dave there half asleep because he's drunk, right? And so he immediately goes, here's where my sermon's going to start, by calling out this drunk. And all the rest of you are looking like, yeah, you drunks, you drunks, you need to pay attention, right? But then don't worry, he's going to call out the rest of us as we go. But it begins with the drunks in verse 5. Awake! Wake up! Wait, wake up, weep, wail. Everybody see those three imperatives? Wake up, weep, wail, you drunkards. Wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. Drunks, you better pay attention, because this is the day of the Lord, and your wine is running out. Why is it running out, everyone? Right, the locusts. Somebody said, why is all the wine gone? Right, thank you, because... The locusts have eaten all the grapes. Now, you may not, as a drunk, you may not have cared about anything else. But you're going to care that all the wine is gone. And that's why Joel says, you drunks better pay attention. This affects you. Your wine is running out. Verse 6, for a nation has come up against my land. Notice that the Lord, this is Joel speaking the message that God has given him. So he calls it my land. This land was given, right? This is the Lord's land that he gave promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the children of Israel. It's his land. He can do with it what he wants, can't he? Everybody, he can allow lo locust plague or even an invading army to come into his land if he wishes, can't he? It's his land. But here he says, a nation has come up against my land. He's going to describe the locusts as if they're a nation, as if they're an invading army. He says, nations come up, they're strong and they're without number. Now, everybody picturing those grasshoppers flying in the video? Strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. Now, you and I are going, wait, this is too many metaphors. A nation, a locust plague, and now a lion. But you've got it, right? Joel's audience could keep up with it. You can keep up with it. Verse 7, he has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree, he has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Because locusts have been known to eat the bark even right off of certain kinds of trees. But which, which two plants have been mentioned specifically here? We just read? The, the what? The vine and the fig tree. And do you know which images are used over and over again in the prophets in the Old Testament as symbols of God's people? the vine, and the fig tree. Do you know which, in, which, which plants are used over and over again as a symbol of God's blessing to his people? The vine and the fig tree. And now help me out. Which two things did Joel just call out as things that are being devastated by the locust? Totally stripped bare. Which two things? The vine, the vine and the fig tree. Right? He's doing this on purpose. This is almost just stock language for the prophets. His branches are made white. In verse 8, Lament, or your translations might have, grieve. Whew, this mourn, this gets colorful. Now, if you wanted to do an interesting study and put this in your little notebooks, look through, Nola did this already uh, on her own without being, without being cued for it. Look for the places in Joel, especially chapter 1 here, but throughout the book where Joel is calling people to mourn. There's a time to Lament. There's a time to stop laughing everything off and to take something seriously. To take it so seriously that you would weep. But how does he say that we should, they should weep in this verse? Lament, mourn, grieve, like what? Picture a young woman who's been waiting years to start her marriage and to start her family. And she's excited about it, and she's been dreaming about it, and she's been talking about it, and she's been preparing for it. In fact, she and her, her mom and sisters went, and they've 
made this really nice dress. It's a beautiful dress for the wedding. And the night before, her groom passed away. So instead of that dress that she picked out, what's she wearing? She's sackcloth. She's wearing burlap. It was the, the, the clothing of a person in mourning. Today, she would be wearing all black. She's a woman in mourning. And Joel says, drunkards, especially you, but all the inhabitants of the land, you should grieve like that. Moaning, weeping. People hear you crying and your eyes are running out of tears. You need to, you need to lament and mourn like that because of what's happening, because of the day of the Lord is here. Verse 9, the grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Yah. And without going into all the details, it's hard to keep up with them all. You know that certain sacrifices in the Old Testament sacrificial system had to be accompanied by certain drink offerings, right? And without those drink offerings, then you're not doing the sacrifice correctly, right, everybody? And without the grapes, then you can't have the wine drink offering. So if the locusts are eating all the grapes, now you don't have the wine drink offering that's supposed to accompany the other offering, which means that the grain offerings, because the grain's been eaten up, and the drink offerings that are part of the sacrificial system and the acts of worship in Jerusalem there at the temple, now we can't do them anymore. Worship is not the same. So because of that, in verse 9, the priests mourn. Everybody's mourning or should be mourning. Who minister to the Yah? Verse 10, the field is wasted. The land itself is personified as in mourning. For the grain is ruined, the new wine is dried up, and the oil fades. We're going to begin specifically, though, with the drunks. Drunks, you better pay attention because this is the day of the Lord and your wine is running out. Let's do something. Let's do some note-taking. Ready, everybody? If you have your little blue notebooks, this is some time to make use of it. Um, if you don't have your little blue notebook, that's okay. We're going to show you some places to underline your Bibles. Do you guys have something to underline or a different color highlighter? How many of you came prepared today with several different color pens? You are the A-plus students. Man, perfect. Okay, so this one, I chose red. I don't know, red might be a good one. You know how in English... You can tell what's an imperative. An imperative is a command. And you can tell what is a command by how somebody says it, by the context. If I were to say to you, you must buy a blue notebook. You must bring your blue notebook to church. You must get out of here. You can tell, but I'm using the word must. This is a command. When other languages, especially Hebrew and Greek, you can tell whether it's a command by the form of the word itself. Like It's, it's not guesswork. It, form of the word itself tells you if it's an imperative, a command. And I want to show you some of those here in Joel because they're important. And I'll show you why they're important. Um, I have another picture of uh, some of these. I don't know if you can see this or not, but this is chapter one. And obviously you can see a little bit of my locust there, which is, what are you laughing about? <laughs> Thank you. Everyone's giggling. I'm going to come look at your locust after church today. There, I want to show you some words that are used. Now, your translations may have different words, but you'll figure it out. These are commands. These are imperatives. In verse 2, hear, listen, tell. That's a section. Ready? Verse 5, underline, circle, wake up, weep, wail. There's actually going to be 17 of these. I'm going to list them out over here. For you. Let me give you the rest of them, though. Uh, verse, verse 8, grieve. That is an imperative. Let's skip on down. Verse 11, be ashamed. That's an imperative. Wail. Verse 11, be ashamed. Wail. Verse 13, we have a whole bunch of them. All those are imperatives in verse 13. Verse 14. Announce. Proclaim. Announce and proclaim in verse 14. Both of those are imperatives. Verse 14. All of those are imperatives. Verse 2 and 3. Then verse 5, he speaks to the drunks. And then he goes down. 
plans. In other words, what's he saying? Do something. Wake up, drunks. Do something. The question is what? He's already told us that as well, but do what? In fact, you wrote those on your cards earlier today. Joel is saying, pay attention. This is the day of the Lord. You need to do something. This is not the time to go do nothing. This is not the time to sit around and do nothing. This is the time to do something. That's why all the commands do something. And first he calls out the drunks. And now he's going to call out the farmers. They're the second people. They are affected directly by the locusts. He says, farmers, pay attention. This is the day of the Lord, and your crops are all withering. And you know this. Farmers, verse 11, uh, figuratively, it's translated, be ashamed. What is that literally? Does anybody know? Anybody have a translation there? It's very literal. I have a footnote there, verse 11. Instead of be ashamed, this is there. That's another figurative way of taking this. Literally, it's be withered. Withered. So I'm going to ask you in just a moment. We'll, we're not going to do it right now, but just a moment. I'm going to point out the rest of these to you. But right now, if you put a little box around the word ashamed, or what was it, despair? That's the word withered. Hovish. Now, uh, somebody show me in body language, what does it look like to be withered? Can you do it? What does it look like? What are you doing, Smokey? We do that? Yeah. So do you mind standing up and doing that for everybody? <laughs> you don't want to? Okay, this is what Smokey was doing. Everybody ready? I'm going to be withered. Oh. <laughs> right? Do I look withered like a leaf? All right, that's going to be an important play on words here. You farmers, be withered like your crops are. And they go, we know about that. Wail, you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine has dried up, and the fig tree has withered. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are withered. All of them are. And he names off the ones, these fruit trees, that you would miss that right away, wouldn't you, everybody? If it was apple harvest time and there were no apples, wouldn't you really miss that? That's going to directly impact our economy too, isn't it? If that's what I do, I own an orchard. Now I'm in trouble. I'm one of the farmers. And as a farmer, Joel says, you better be ashamed. You better be in despair. You better be withered like your plants are because you're in big trouble. And this isn't just a locust plague. This is the day of the Lord, farmers. So pay attention to this. All the trees of the field are withered. I've named a few, but all of them are withered. And then he goes and says it in verse 12. Surely joy itself has withered away from the sons of men. Pay attention, farmers. This is not just a regular locust plague. This is God's hand against us. This is the day of the Lord, and you need to do something. Pay attention to the day of the Lord. Farmers, you'd better pay attention. Drunks, you better pay attention. If you have your um, blue notebooks now, or you have something to, a little pencil or something to make a note, if you'll turn to that verse there for the farmers, verse 11. I'll show you where we can, maybe a gray box or something like that. We'll set these words apart. Verse 11, be ashamed. The word ashamed is the word withered. Hovish, be hovish, you farmers. That's the first one. Put a box around that. Verse. By the way, you know your translations don't always use, what we should do in English is we should translate as best we can the same way in English every single time. But you don't have that. Okay, so hang on, hang in there with me. Verse 12, the grapevine is dried up. That's the word hovish, it's withered. Put a box around dried up. And I know that the next line says the fig tree is withered. That's not the same word. It's okay, it's similar, same idea. But later you say all the trees of the orchard have, go ahead, what is it? Withered, that should be box around that one. Indeed, human joy has dried up. That should be the word withered. Okay, it's actually going to occur a couple more times, so let's look at those. Verse 17, at the end of verse 17, the grain has withered away. 
That's the word hovish there. And then one more time, verse 20. Wild animals cry out to you for the riverbeds are they're dried up. That's the word hovish. They're all withered. Riverbeds are withered. The grain has withered. But notice that most of the occurrences of this happens in verses 11 through 12 where Joel is telling the farmers, look, you guys, yourselves, you should be withered. Just like all your plants are withered. But then he brings it home at the end of verse 12 by saying, indeed what? Human joy is withered. You're the tree. Joy is the fruit. And it's gone. It's dried up. That's the kind of colorful things that the prophets do. Drunks, pay attention. Farmers, you'd better pay attention. Verse 13, and you priests, especially you priests, better pay attention. Verse 13, gird yourselves, put on clothes, and lament, you priests. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. Everybody see all these imperatives? You did some underlining before. See how many? It's rapid fire commands. Most of them are given to the priests. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Just worship is not the same. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Yah, your God, and cry out to the Yah. You guys, you priests especially, everybody's looking to you. I forgot to do something. This will make you moan. These are set for an hour, by the way. I just want to make sure we know how much time we have left. <laughs> right, Kara? <laughs> you priests especially, everybody's looking to you. You will set the, the pace. You will lead the way. You're busy in the house of the Lord, but you're not as busy as you used to be because now there's no more grain offerings, there's no more drink offerings to accompany the other offerings. People aren't bringing those things anymore because they don't have them because the locusts are eating them all. You guys need to set the pace. So what you need to do is stop dressing and acting like business as usual. It's not. This is the day of the Lord. Judgment is coming upon us. So go and you find some burlap. And put it on. And let people hear you wailing. Thankfully, I think, if I asked you, most of you have not wailed before. And then there are those of you who have. For those of you who have wailed, it's, it's not something to joke around about, is it? It's not something to even try to do when you don't actually have to do it. It's awful. A, a moaning scream of total desperation. And that's what Joel is describing, that you priests need to do it. It needs to come from here, of course, but you need to do it and let everybody outside these walls of the temple hear it. Then they'll realize something serious is going on. Blow the shofar. Call in the people to stop eating and everybody to put on sackcloth like you are let there be true repentance. Do that. And maybe something could change. After all, we know about Nineveh, right, everybody? The king called it out. No one's going to eat. Everybody's going to mourn. Everybody's going to repent. Maybe the Lord will stop punishing us. And to save the city, priests, lead the way. I want to ask you to do something in your notebooks now before we go any further. And this probably is one of the most important things we do today. Under that section where it says, talks about the priests there through verse 14. Drunks, you better pay attention. Farmers, you better pay attention. Priests, you better pay attention. Command, 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 command. You better do something. Everybody, what do they need to do? Some of you are going to write down, well, they need to repent. That's not good enough. I want, to, I want to ask you, what do they describe? Describe what the people should do for this to be a happy ending. Well, they need to get right with God, brother. I want you to describe it. What does that look like? Well, they need to turn. No, to stop. Don't use big words, like general words. Specifically, what would you like to see the people doing to turn this into a happy ending? Take just a moment and jot that down. Just a few words. What do they need to do?
time is running out. Here's the second part of this. is probably even the most important. What do I need to do? Maybe just jot that down. We'll come back to it later. You already spent some time on that on your card. What do I need to do? At the end, verses 15 to 20, Joel once again gives a general call. Pay attention to the foreshadow. Pay attention to the day of the Lord. Verse 15, alas for the day. This is it, everybody. This is it. The end. If you're highlighting this week in your homework, you highlighted the day. Because what comes directly after it? For the day of the Lord is at hand. It's near. It shall come as a shattering from the Shaddai. Destruction from the Almighty. Is not the food cut off before our eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the clods. This is a hard Hebrew expression that means there's seed in the ground, but the ground's so dry and parts, nothing's growing. Storehouses are in shambles. Barns are broken down, for the grain is withered. There's no, there's no grain to put in them, so nobody's using them. They're all just falling apart. How the animals groan. Even the animals are affected by this. The herds of cattle are restless because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment. Verse 19, Joel gives us the example of what to do. O Yah, to you I cry out. For fire has devoured the open pastures, and a flame has burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field also cry out to you. For the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the open pastures. Did everybody hear that? Verse 19, verse 20, and fire has devoured the open pastures. Now, he may mean this literally. He probably does. Drought and locusts uh, go together. There is a connection between this phenomenon. When things are dry, it pushes the locusts together, and they form these swarms, and that makes things worse, and they eat everything. And then imagine they, they, they eat everything. It's already dry. It's easy for wildfires to burn. So he may very well mean that literally. There's a burning or he may mean it figuratively. People have described a locust plague. They, locusts came through an area and their people had saw the area and described it as it looks like a wildfire came through here. That's how much the locusts have devastated the land. Either way, it's a very good image for God's judgment against us. And the pastures are on fire. Things that used to be green and beautiful and flowers and things that gave us peace, seeing the cattle just grazing those things are gone fire has burned up everything everything is burning it's the day of the lord alas it's the day of the lord pay attention to the day of the lord no one's paying attention he's calling them all out and one thing joel tells us and he makes it very clear in his prophecy is this the day of the lord is always dangerous always dangerous not for me it's always dangerous and it's always closer than we think right? We're all glad we're guaranteed our 85 years, right? We're guaranteed it. And we're so shocked when we're not. We lose our minds when we're not. But it's always closer than we think in some form or another. And then an ultimate day of the Lord is on its way. And if that's all true, then the real questions I'm left with are these two that I think are the most important for me. Am I right? Am I ready? Am I right with God? Am I ready for God? In just a moment, I'll ask the praise team if they would go ahead and come up now. In just a moment, I'm going to leave you just to um, have some time alone to pray over those two questions. Am I right? Am I ready? 